Welcome to our virtual edition of Breakfast at Blake. I'm John Ferdell, class of 1985, and the newest member of the advancement team serving in the role as Director of Alumni and Parent Engagement. On behalf of the Blake School, I'm thrilled you can join us this morning for Blake's first remote Breakfast at Blake. We are honored to have two of our Blake faculty members, Raina Green and Beth Calderon, who are eager to share how they have adapted their teaching for Blake's remote teaching and learning plan. In this morning's session titled, We the People, Responses to COVID-19, you will experience what, it will, what it's like to be a Blake eighth grade student in a newly created social studies unit using any interactive resources. Um, as a result of COVID-19, Blake's learning environment has transformed and required accelerated utilization of technology and information sharing, as well as flexibility, creativity, and nimbleness of faculty and students. Before we officially get started, I wanted to cover a few housekeeping items for our virtual sessions and introduce Raina and Beth uh, to officially begin our class. I'd like to begin by asking you to please keep your video off during the main presentation. We will ask you to turn it on for the breakout session. You're welcome to post any questions throughout the program. You can do that by clicking on the chat button located at the bottom of the Zoom screen right in the middle. Click chat and then type your question. If you do not see the chat button, you may have to click the more button first. Questions will be monitored and share questions at various points during the program. Raina and Beth will also address the questions you posed when registering for the event. We will also allow some time at the end of the session for questions. A member of the Blake's team, Mara Mitchell, will share the questions during our session. Also, please be prepared as Raina will take a poll or two during her civic lessons. So I encourage you to get involved. Lastly, the main session today is being videotaped and the speakers and their slides will be captured. The breakout sessions will not be taped and we will have this video available for you next week. So I'm honored to introduce Raina Green and Beth Calderon as they each explain how the pandemic and the historical significance of COVID-19 has created opportunities for, for both faculty and students to evolve. Raina has taught social studies at Blake for the past 18 years after earning a master's degree in educational policy and administration um, and her social studies teaching licensure from the University of Minnesota. Go Golden Gophers. Prior to getting her master's, Raina earned a BA from Lewis and Clark College. And she and her husband, David, are parents of two boys, a Blake kindergartner and a toddler. Beth currently serves as the PK-12 social studies chair. She be began at Blake in 2008 as part of the upper school so social studies faculty, teaching a range of courses from ninth grade modern world history, ancient roots of modern thought, global online academy big history, 10th grade U.S. history, intro to economics, AP microeconomics, and world religions, as well as a recent year of teaching sixth grade humanities. She earned a BA in religion and the humanities at the University of Chicago and a master of theological studies with certification in the program of religion and secondary education, which is a partnership licensure program between Harvard Divinity School and Harvard Graduate School of Education. She is a parent of a Blake fourth grader and a first grader. Raina and Beth, thanks for being with us this morning. Please take it away. All right. Good morning, everyone. This is certainly the most excitement my basement has seen ever. So thanks so much for being here. I'm really excited to share what's going on in my virtual classroom, but I would say this could be presented by anyone at Blake. The teachers in our institution are so remarkable in their ability to pivot and innovate and truly all teachers across the country right now. Um, I just cannot say enough about how much effort is being made to try to maintain connections with our kiddos and keep us moving ahead with our content and skill building. So I'm going to allow uh, Beth to take quite a bit of the reins in the first few slides here as she can talk in her capacity as department chair about some of the ways in which our department was pretty well uh, positioned 
to make this pivot. A lot of what we do at Blake um, in the social studies department really lent itself to remote teaching. Uh, so Beth's going to talk a little bit about some of the inquiry and historical thinking skills that we already have embedded. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, yeah, so as Raina said, <clears throat> um, I, <clears throat> I want to sort of talk from the big sort of 10,000 foot level um, about sort of our department wide goals in social studies. And, and then, as Raina said, she can zoom into sort of the, the six or eight social studies structure, particularly in the last couple of years, um, really sort of remaking itself um, around our one to one laptop initiative starting in sixth grade. And so um, those resources and those technological skills that our middle school kids have had over the last couple of years certainly played a role in, I think, the success of, of pivoting uh, fairly fluidly to RTLP, remote teaching and learning, um, this spring. So um, at a large level, we have spent the last couple of years um, institutionally, but certainly focused in the social studies classrooms as well, thinking about three sort of big ideas. Um, and one is just multiple perspectives, that idea that um, we, are, we are not just plowing through one textbook. Um, we, want to, we want to expose students to a wide variety of ideas and resources. Um, and really importantly, and I think this might feel a little counterintuitive, we want to look for bias. We want to sort of get, cleanse students from the sense that bias equals bad. Right, that bias is something that we all have, and the more that we can identify our bias, the better. Um, and, and it allows us, I think, to communicate in a more authentic way. So we need a wide swath of stories and experiences from which to glean um, knowledge from the past, but also to help us frame questions, new and old, that we can use for the present. So multiple perspectives. Um, second is really about inquiry through case studies. Um, again, we're not trying to sort of just cover, um, a, you know, at an inch deep sort of a, a wide um, sort of content area. Instead, we really think long and hard about how we develop student skills of inquiry through more, um, more deeply felt um, case studies. And then that, that leads to a third one, which is something I think as a department, um, it's fair to say we grapple with. Um, and that is, you know, this sort of dichotomy that you hear out in the ether around content and skills that you, you're either doing one or the other. And we just think that that's a false dichotomy. We really think that students need deep engagement with content in order to develop skills. Um, and so, you know, as, as you'll hear a little bit more about and hopefully get a feel in, in Raina's presentation and the class that she'll walk you through both in a meta way, but also in a participatory way. Um, you can see that there's an emphasis on discussion skills. There's an emphasis on historical thinking. Um, and that comes from a framework that we've spent some time working on um, as a department around this idea, um, a framework that comes out of the Stanford History Education Group. So we didn't invent it, but we certainly have sort of made it our own in our own Blake way. Um, and that is to think about when we approach any kind of text and text defined very loosely, um, how are we looking at sourcing? How are we, how are we training our, 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 our students to really think about sourcing? And that's sort of the activity you'll do later today. Um, contextualization, how do we put things in context? Close reading and analysis, um, what do we do with language and rhetoric that, um, that helps us sort of uncover that bias that we're looking for so we can make sense of it and make meaning for ourselves? Um, and then corroboration, how do we not just sort of think about single stories, but try and make, try and find some truth by putting lots of different perspectives together? And all of those are sort of the component, components under a banner of critical thinking. Um, so we, we use critical thinking in a really holistic way in the social studies. Um, Raina, I think, is going to, um, I'm going to turn it back over to Raina so that she can talk a little bit more of, um, about maybe your own experiences in history class, and we'll do a quick poll. Back to you, Raina. Yeah. <clears throat> so I thought it would be fun at this point for you to warm up your uh, computer tech skills and get you feeling a little less nervous about the Zoom call. Um, polling allows us to interact with our students in the Zoom world, and you may or may not have ever participated in one. So I'm launching a poll now for you to think about your history experience back in the day. And I know that I also had a few um, of my own student uh, students as regist 
uh, having registered for this breakfast at Blake. So I'm guessing even for some of those students who had me for social studies in eighth grade, this course that I have now probably is much different than even what they experienced. So I'll give you um, about 30 more seconds to address the poll that you see on your screen. And then we'll move into some description of eighth grade social studies. Maybe I'll just add for those of you who, um, who are partial to football coaches in your past too. Um, my favorite history teacher was in fact a football coach. So, you know, lots of different entry points here. Yep. Yeah, that was gleaned from personal experience, that particular <laughs> option. And we have several actually, as I'm looking at the poll results. Um, so I'm going to end the poll now so I can move on. Um, I'm not surprised to see that there are a lot of history buffs in here, folks who identified that they enjoyed history class. And I'm also not at all surprised to see that leading the, the way of options was that you memorized a lot of names, dates, and events. And that's generally the experience of most folks in their uh, history course, um, because that's what we did. We just, we tried to understand the content by memorizing all of it. All right. So moving on, the course that I have now in place in the eighth grade, which leverages the laptop laptop initiative, um, allowing us to really do deep inquiry using our own devices through the guidance of me, the mentor teacher, uh, is framed around the U.S. Constitution's preamble. And so the core question that we've been asking all year is how, in fact, do we form a more perfect union? And how have we in the past 100 years or so really tried to hone in on um, what we mean when we say we the people um, and provide for the common defense and so on. So that first unit of study is really about who defines the people that make up this country. And we look at immigration policy past and present. The second unit framed around the common defense is about foreign policy specifically, and especially dealing with foreign threat through the study of the wars that we've engaged in um, all the way up into the modern day uh, war on terror. And uh, that one is, of course, fascinating for many of our students who have sort of on their own learned a little bit about um, World War II, for instance. Lots of folks are history buffs in that way. Um, and then moving into the general welfare and domestic tranquility unit, that one is des designed to help kids get a better understanding of what we mean when we say conservative or liberal political ideology. And so we try to better understand our two primary parties in the U.S. and how they have changed over the last hundred years, as well as what, what role the media plays in our democratic republic. And so um, those are the skills of media literacy that you all will be practicing later in the breakout room. And then in our final unit uh, of study, we look at social justice and civic activism uh, through the civil rights era and all the way up into some of the modern identity um, issues that are continuing to be a focal point in our country today. Uh, before I move on from this, I wanted to share with you an example um, of student work from the very beginning of the year and how we work with sources, as well as another one um, from our final units. You can see how they evolve in their ability to think like historians. So what you're seeing on your screen now is our very first source analysis of the year. So source one, a poem inscribed on the base of the Statue of Liberty, which contains the very famous line, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free that some of you may be familiar with. So a lot of these um, comments onto the side are what the student generated through the course of our class. And this at the beginning of the year is modeled by me and with co-construction of the students' ideas, um, we do sourcing uh, together at the start of the year, contextualizing together as a class. And then they closely read on their own and look for words and phrases and try to make sense of them. So we were talking a lot in this source about why Lazarus, the poet references the Colossus what is it about her background that primed her for writing this important poem? What was it about this time period um, and obviously the location? And then what were her words and what did they really mean? And so you can see um, even taking a very short poem results in quite a bit of annotation and our students get very, very robust annotation skills um, over the course of their careers at the middle school and on through high school. And then in the final uh, example, now you can see how everything is even more at a fine tooth 
uh, level. You can see in sourcing, this student is grappling with the background of the author. In this case, it was a speech that she was reading um, from a man named Stokely Carmichael, uh, a speech given at University of California, Berkeley in 1966 called Black Power. And so now beyond just thinking about who the person was who gave the speech, also thinking about whether we can trust this voice as trustworthy from the experiences that they brought to the table, what their perspective was that they were trying to share to their audience, what the main ideas were of the text, claims that were powerful, and then figuring out how it fits into what we've already talked about throughout the year. And so at that point in the unit, the student had already learned quite a bit about Dr. King and the early activism in the late 50s and early 60s, and then thinking about how now, um, even today, we still continue to see some of the same problems in communities of color across the nation. And then lastly, you'll see some of those critical thinking skills um, that Beth alluded to. So this is the type of work we do in my class all the time, and we make meaning together. So a student might be working with a partner on something like this, um, and then at the end of this close read, they'll take time to work together to really polish their thinking um, before we have a seminar. And we always uh, embed Socratic seminar into really every unit of study and really any source that we uh, try to read, we also talk about it so that we can make meaning together. And then oftentimes we will also write um, write summary statements that we call AEJs. So there's this whole new vocabulary that goes along with being a student of the social studies in the middle school. Um, and so the AEJ stands for assertion, evidence, justification. And it's just a way to really drill down what makes for um, a good argument, a good written argument. And so we feel really strongly that our students are communicating both orally and in writing um, and really building those skills. And then it all came to obviously a very interesting pivot point. Uh, I remember back in March as we approached spring break, our director, J. Dean, coming to meet with us as a faculty and say, here's our plan. And I was just completely in disbelief that we could possibly not have normal school. And I was still clinging to the belief that we were going to be going on the DC trip with our eighth graders. And obviously that all had to change. And so um, David Boxer asked when he registered, what has been the most challenging transition? And I think for me, it is that sense of shock and loss that all of us have experienced now. And, and as we shifted from spring break into a week of asynchronous learning where students were just looking up assignments that I had posted and I was creating uh, video lessons, then having to go online in person for these Zoom meetings, I didn't even know where to have the meetings. Should I try to do it at my kitchen table? I don't really have an office. And so I have two small children and just finding a space to work with my Blake students was difficult. My three-year-old often will interrupt my classes no matter where I settle in. Um, even sometimes they roar into the basement even though I try to keep the door closed. So a big challenge for me was just where, how do I do it? How do I compartmentalize my role as a parent and my role as a teacher. Beth, did you have anything uh, you wanted to share about the shift that you've seen department-wide? Um, I will towards the end, I think, when we transition into questions and answers. Um, but I'll just, I will um, respond to Jason's um, sort of query about whether or not moving forward the bulk of this session would be mostly about eighth grade. And I would just um, say that <clears throat> It, it is to a certain extent because we want you to experience sort of what what uh, Raina's class is. And again, I would just put us back into that sense of, you know, case studies really matter, right? This is, this is actually the kind of thinking that we ask kids to do. How do we go deeply into one thing so that we can find some transferable themes to other places? So, so hang tight. It is mostly eighth grade um, coming forward. But if you have larger questions about lower school and upper school during Q&A, I'm, I'm, um, I'm definitely here to sort of answer those questions as well about how that transfers. All right. Back thanks. To you, so uh, the first thing we had to address was the, la the loss of the eighth grade Washington, D.C. trip. We were slated to depart on March 31st um, for a four-day tour of our nation's capital. And so what I created for that week of study was an opportunity for kids to visit sites virtually. Um, we are fortunate, obviously, very, very fortunate living in a time period when many of these places maintain robust websites with touring options. Um, and then all of our students, of course, have laptops and 
and the ability to connect uh, virtually to these types of spaces. So I tried to create each day's experience um, based around what our itinerary had been. And so to answer the question of how we've modified the curriculum uh, to address what we would have done in DC, uh, each assignment was crafted throughout that week to get them thinking and um, sort of talking in virtual spaces together about the types of things we would have done had we visited the memorials and the White House and the wonderful Smithsonian Museums. Um, and I'll show you an example of an online discussion in a little bit so you can see how they, how they talk with each other. But of course, nothing can completely capture what it feels like to be on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial looking out over the mall or what it feels like to walk through the cattle car in the Holocaust Museum. And so that, that experience for our kids is something that they are mourning the loss of. And I think that's a real, um, a real aspect of helping care for the emotional well-being of our students uh, that is center most in my mind. And so I acknowledged it with them in person before we departed for spring break that it was possible we wouldn't get to go. And then of course, over Zoom, we've talked a number of times about it is a huge bummer. It really is. Um, but in perfect Blake fashion, we were able to connect through our wider community. Um, we, I actually have a couple of alums who work for Senator Cena, Tina Smith. And so they were able to get a, a short video greeting to our eighth graders, which will be sent out to them, um, congratulating them on their accomplishments. So here's a, a moment of that. Hello, Blake School 8th graders and the family and friends of Blake School 8th graders. I'm the Minnesota Senator Tina Smith. So congratulations on graduating from middle school. Your families and friends and your United States Senator are very proud of all that you've accomplished, what you've learned, and the talented, strong, resilient people you're becoming. And then I'm really excited to report that later today, we are actually going to experience a Zoom call with Representative Dean Phillips. Um, for our eighth grade. So that is a way that we've tried to capture some of the magic of that trip and bring it to our eighth graders. Um, the final thing I'll say is that our eighth grade advisory team is all um, grabbing a stack of yearbooks and the t-shirts that our students would have received for the trip and we're going to be hand delivering those uh, later this week and next. So those are some of the ways we tried to adapt to not being able to go on the trip. All right, moving ahead. Oops, pardon me. I think the biggest thing about the creation of this unit and what all of the teachers across Blake's school um, from K, pre-K through 12 is trying to figure out how to support our social emotional lives of our, our students. Um, this is a very difficult time for them. There is a lot of fear out there and uncertainty, obviously, that all of us as adults are coping with. Um, but our younger kids don't necessarily know how to deal with those big feelings and big emotions. And so I thought it was really, really pivotal and important um, to empower my students as eighth graders to uh, understand the information flying at them and to give them a safe space to ask questions about this crisis, about, about the pandemic, and to use those skills that we've been cultivating all year uh, to really dig deeply into what the government is doing in response, what society as a whole is valuing at this time, um, and so my challenge was to try to design a unit that helps them to feel more safe and uh, empowered. And I hope that I've done that. But one of the things we also know about Zoom is the challenge is staring at a screen all day makes for not the most dynamic learning environment. And so you can see on this slide an example of an activity that I do with my students frequently, which is just to get them up and moving. And this was a strike a yoga pose. Um, challenge and <laughs> so I'll do stuff like that all the time with my students just to get them uh, talking and moving and giggling a little bit because that sense of community is probably the most profound thing that we lost initially and you know trying to regain it through Zoom has been an interesting challenge um, and then I will encourage you to just have a quick wiggle break if you would bear with me. This is one of our favorite songs to dance to in my class. Shake it up a little bit. Yo, VIP. Let's kick it. And I can ice, 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 baby. Alright, stop. Collaborate and listen. Ice is back with the brand new inventions. 
Um, so we do stuff like that just to just to get the goofy back. Middle school is a time period where our kids are really nervous and self-conscious, of course, but also still kids. And so doing those types of dance party breaks helps break through the um, the difficulty of connecting through Zoom. And there was another question that came in about um, challenge in engaging with students. It is easy for them to get lost in their screen. It is easy for them to really be kind of in their own world and be feeling even more isolated, um, you know, if they're left alone in their rooms for extended periods of time and they're just kind of trying to sl slog through their their work. So I think one of the most important things that we all need to ask ourselves is how we can stay connected with our kids and how we can make sure, especially for kids um, in this age group that I teach, uh, young adolescents, their brains, their prefrontal cortex are not as well developed and they're not able to resist all of those impulses as well as perhaps a grown up might. And so helping monitor them is really important. And I would implore you, even if your, your teen puts up that surly front and asks to be left alone, that you do check in with them regularly because not only are they grieving a lot of what they've lost this spring, but they also are um, prone to the distraction of these devices and to help them to be fully present with their teachers means they can't have multiple tabs open and multiple windows open. Um, so helping them do that, help us as teachers, because of course we can't, we can't do what we would normally do, which is to walk around the room and tap them on the shoulder and give them all those um, nonverbal cues to help them stay focused. It's impossible to do over Zoom. So all right, moving into a summary of this unit that I created to help you get a sense of what it feels like to be a student in a classroom. These are um, some examples that teachers across Blake are using um, as ways to interact with their students. And so you can see from the unit question, very similar to the course questions throughout the year that we've grappled with, but that adding this layer of now, um, how do we deal with this crisis in a way that keeps people safe, but as well keeps our economy going um, and how do we address some of our core values as a nation the sense of uh, our liberty being threatened but yet security being so central um, and so with students have really been talking a lot about all of these types of questions and one of the ways I get them talking is through um, a program called Pear Deck and this is just something that uses Google Slides to create an interactive slideshow experience for my for students and we've used this tool all year so my students were very familiar with Pear Deck um, as a mode of communication and in this early slideshow uh, we just were trying to set the stage for what the unit was going to be about so what you'll see um, in this is on the right side here um, student answers. So when you get a Pear Deck slideshow built, you're creating interactive slides to let them share with you their ideas. And so here's some examples of what they've understood already about the pandemic. And then you can also create slides like this one where they drag um, flags to show what they understand. And so in this question, I'd ask them, what are some of the factors that you think were particularly responsible for the spread of COVID-19? Um, and so a lot of them drag their flag to global um, travel as a, as a main factor and then medical practices and so on. And so that's a really helpful tool to get kids starting to think together um, and collaborate. And we had a question come in about centering student voice. And so Pear Deck is something that I use all year to help center student voices. Pear Deck also allows us to do this type of slide where we can check in with the social emotional well-being of our students. And the students themselves don't ever see who put their uh, line or flag any in any location. I can show them what this slide looks like, but I would never, it doesn't identify students. So there's an anonymity there that feels really safe for them. Um, but I can, as the teacher, know which name goes with which bar. And so if I had a student down in the 10 range, I could follow up with them at a later date and make sure that they were feeling well supported. Um, and so in this lesson, you'll, you're seeing how I used this particular technology to help our students engage with each other and engage with me. Um, and also using technology that we already have. So things like Google Earth to explore the origins of the pandemic. Um, and then I'll show one more example of a type of question that I ask all the time. So this type of um, continuum range of, of thought on a, on a given statement, agree to disagree. Um, they drag their dot and then they can see visually where they stack up against their classmates. Um, and that, that can be really helpful to spark discussion. So this is a, a Pear Deck done at the very beginning of the unit back in early April. 
Um, another way we interacted online using technology was through Padlet, and that's another thing that many teachers at Blake use. And essentially, it's a glorified wall to post onto. And so in this exercise, I was asking students to look up news articles about government responses all over the place to the pandemic. And so, you know, anywhere from what was Brazil doing to Germany, and then, you know, of course, in the Midwest and so on. And so they're charged in this assignment with finding a cred credible news source and then sharing it out with each other by posting it to this Padlet. So that's another way to get kids um, to pool resources and to leverage the technology skills that we've already developed throughout the year. I'm gonna share with you now a bit of a Zoom um, recording. So you're gonna hear me talking as the teacher now. And so I will shut up in this presentation and just let you listen to the video. But uh, here you'll see a second follow-up Pear Deck lesson a um, couple weeks after the first one, where we were really thinking about the government's response and building on some lessons we had done about the stimulus package that was passed and trying to better understand um, what, we're, what we were doing. So you'll see in this recording, how I try to get kids up and moving, how I uh, try to uh, get us interacting using Pear Deck. Um, and you'll just see in real time what it is like uh, to be a teacher in this environment. So the start of every class, it always takes a little while for everyone to join. So the first minute or so is just sort of waiting and giving them some instruction. Um, and then I launched them onto this uh, scavenger hunt, which required them to look for a roll of toilet paper, a framed picture, and a spoon. So I figured that would make them have to go to multiple rooms in their in their home. And so this gave them a chance to just move around. And so here's the end results of that. And then I'll just let it play for a minute or two so you can see what the lesson feels like from the student perspective. So fast. I see price. Wait, what do we need to get? Manual. Uh, spoon and a roll of toilet paper. Frame photo and a roll of toilet paper. Wait, who else? Who Wait, else? A frame photo, photo and a roll of toilet paper. Oh, and a spoon. That ship has sailed, Sarah. I'm so sorry. There are already five winners. Ah, oh, damn. Am I one? Oh wait, no. I got rid of all the photos in my room because I hate photos. So. Oh, Usman, I didn't see yours. I believe that you did it very fast too. Show me what you got, man. Yes. Congratulations. Yes. I know some of you, that's like not your jam, doing a scavenger hunt to start class, but it was a way to make you stand up, which some of you probably haven't done in like an hour. So, you know, for those of you who participated, thank you. And I'm glad to see many of you have this hot commodity. This is my favorite cooking spoon. And here's a picture of your teacher when I'm a tiny kid with my big sister. <laughs> so there you go. Congratulations, all. Happy Tuesday. I know it's a gloomy day, but I have a, I think, a Pear Deck that you'll find interesting. Um, and yeah, we'll come back together with a couple of breakout opportunities and conversation opportunities. But for now, if you haven't joined the Pear Deck, which most of you have, you can see in the chat um, the link to it and or you can just go to joinpd.com. Actually, it looks like you're all in. So let's start. Those of you who are like, what are they all doing? They were doing the scavenger hunt, but we're going to move on from there now. So I'm going to dig a little deeper into this idea of government response to COVID and take a look at a couple of very recent updates to government reactions um, at the boat. Drink bleach, it cures COVID. Right. <laughs> at the federal and um, state level, there's been some major um, changes in policy in the last week. Bleach. And bleach yeah. kills COVID. We'll definitely talk about injecting All ourselves right, with so life. Obviously, certain students uh, sometimes take advantage of having the mic, so to speak. And so part of balancing out a Zoom call is to help kids learn when it's appropriate to sort of share their opinion and when it's time for them to just listen. And so what we can do as teachers is mute kids. And so sometimes I have to, I always let the kids know in advance, I'm going to mute them. Um, and so here you can see in real time, their response to that kind of query of agree versus disagree. Of responding to the COVID. By good job, do you mean killing people or saving people? Uh, I need clarification. They've got to drink. I will, let, I will let you interpret what good job means. And I'm going to put you on mute for a quick sec, my darling. 
<laughs> while I talk a little bit more about some of what we're going to do. Okay, so showing responses. We are, not surprisingly, all over the board. All right, and so, so I'm going to pause the video there and uh, just to have you note that students have a range of opinion on this subject, and obviously some of our kids and the one that was speaking a lot had strong f negative feelings, but of course there are students in the room who support what's happening at the federal level, and that's important for our students to see visually. And so when I share a screen, I always try to make them take note of that and not assume they understand everybody's frame of mind. There's often a bias in the room at Blake um, that students sometimes don't acknowledge uh, that there are plenty of, of uh, conservative ideas and voices that are just as valuable um, as the sometimes more outspoken liberal voices in the room. And so then in this lesson, we went on to learn more about HR Bill 266 that had just been signed into law from President Trump. Uh, and it involved uh, increasing stimulus to the Paycheck Protection Program. So we watched a little bit of the video of his signing ceremony. Um, and then we discussed further using this Pear Deck Forum, our questions that we had about that bill. The other thing that Zoom also has is an active chat feature, which many of you are participating in. And so students um, are often posing questions or uh, sharing ideas with each other in a chat. And this is a particularly chatty class. Um, and so that can give you a sense of how at Blake we are using multiple modalities, um, multiple technologies, sometimes simultaneously to help our students uh, connect with each other and understand new content. And then the last thing I want to show on this page before I get you guys talking with each other is a final discussion um, vehicle that I use throughout the year uh, and has been instrumental during this time of remote learning. It's called Kialo. And in this particular iteration of a discussion, I wanted students to create their own thesis statement um, and then make claims in support of multiple thesis statements. Sometimes I'll set up a discussion where I pose one thesis statement and then they're just making claims in favor of or in opposition to that thesis. But in this case, I wanted them to share the range of topics they had been researching for their final project. So the the questions or the thesis statements ranged from, you know, using better social distancing, uh, increasing our capacity for testing, um, focusing on healthcare and healthcare workers, mental health, and so on and so forth. And so in Kialo, you can have a range of ideas that are expressed this way. And then another thing that I love about it is you can let students vote on the veracity of the statements that are posted. And so the darker the color, the more students sort of liked that claim or liked that thesis. Um, and then you can see in branching conversation, for instance, starting from this initial claim, so maintaining, the government should be maintaining a balance so the economy can stay stable. Um, sparked a response in the negative, that would be good in theory, and then someone agreeing with that student, and then someone agreeing with that student. So you can get these long branched conversations, um, and it can be just a really cool way for kids to interact. Um, adults use Kialo too, it's an open source platform, so if you have any interest in logging on to kialo.com, um, there's some really cool and interesting discussions out there. Uh, but this is one we did just last week to try to talk with each other about COVID-19 and the research we had done individually about a facet of the pandemic. Finally, I know I'm skipping the economics one now, but basically just know that I try to do a little bit of econ with the students too and help them better understand what it means when the stock market crashed and they work together to create some slideshows about macro indicators and the stimulus package. Um, I do wanna move us on to media literacy so that you guys can talk with each other and connect. All right, so we're getting folks back from the breakout room. Welcome back, everyone. Just a reminder to now stop your video and mute yourself again. Um, you will have a chance, um, perhaps at the very end, uh, to do some Q&A, but otherwise we're going to keep this simple and have everyone um, with their videos stopped and their microphones muted. So thank you so much for that. I'm going to share the results of our media and the pandemic poll because I'm not sure everyone had a chance to see those before they joined their breakout room. And I'm hoping that to that third question, anyone who felt confused um, now has a couple of new questions in mind that they can ask themselves when they see a source of news 
and um, use those sourcing questions to help them discern between fact and fake. Um, although fake is also, we obviously realize, taken with a grain of salt, um, multiple news sources or sources that purport themselves to be news aren't exactly fake, but they are heavily biased. And so we talk a lot about that in our class. Um, and so I'm going to move on now to just a couple tiny more sharing outs of what our students are doing. So this is an example of students in uh, eighth grade, what they came up with in response to those questions posed about the sources. Um, and so in this student's case, they looked into the background of the author, thought about the publication itself, and even got into the, the fact that it was published um, out of McLean, Virginia. Um, and concluded that even though the uh, audience is meant to be pretty widespread and does sort of acknowledge some of the bias in the story itself, um, that this is a fairly reliable and credible news source. And then in the other example, my students um, kind of had an advantage over any of you who have not yet seen Wonkat as a news source. Um, we used the Wonkat and multiple other sources in our partisanship um, unit in December to better understand media literacy in today, uh, today's day and age. And so they already kind of, that's like a huge red flag. We, we often laugh about Wonkat headlines <laughs> together. Um, and so, of course, Dr. Zoom, this PhD in rhetoric author, um, Wonkat is really more of a blog, not so much a source of credible, um, objective news. And, uh, Obviously, the student concluded that it had too heavy a left-leaning bias to be really a reliable source. So that's some of what they concluded. Um, and then I just wanted to share that as we culminated this unit, students were conducting some research on their own using the skills they had garnered throughout the time in the middle school in particular doing the influential research project, which is their eighth grade capstone. We worked a lot with databases, and so they did um, continue those skills um, to research a topic of their choosing. And then they were charged with creating some outreach of some sort. So some of them wrote letters to media outlets, compelling them to please report more on an issue. Um, others of them wrote to people in power. Um, and so I wanted to share this sample of a student who wrote to um, Representative Phillips and excuse me, the Zoom kind of got out of hand there. And so in this case, the student was interested in the issue of um, economic and uh, health disparities that are being experienced in the African American community. And so a, a person had asked about how we might be covering some of those health and e economic disparities in our country at this time. Um, we've talked about it throughout the unit, and then this student in particular wanted to focus on the issue um, for her final outreach. Um, students, I also wanted to give a lot of agency and choice here though, so instead of compelling all of them to take on a social action sort of step reaching out to somebody, I also wanted to give them a chance at self-expression. And so we had several students choose the art option um, to sort of visually capture their topic of research. And so in this student's case, uh, they were interested in thinking about the lack of access to PPE and the struggles of the healthcare workers in our country. And so they created this piece and then an accompanying artist statement to explain their focus. And then I'll just share one final source and then open it up for Beth because um, it fits right in with the media literacy discussion you just had. This was a student's short film that they created. So you can see a variety of ways that students uh, in the eighth grade, at least, are grappling with what's happening in the world around them. And so um, thank you for listening to my deep dive into what's been happening in eighth grade social studies. Uh, now Beth is going to talk a little bit more about how department wide we engage in some of these skills that you see on screen and how many of the teachers have done a remarkable job of pivoting in into the remote teaching environment. But I did just want to finally emphasize how important it is 
to us that our students feel empowered to go out and be change agents um, and engage in civil discourse. I know a lot of you were interested in the chat about how we help kids practice that skill. We all acknowledge that as adults, we haven't modeled it well for them. Um, so it, it is true that they see often the fighting and angry um, talk show panelists that can't come to any consensus. Um, but we really give them lots and lots of opportunities to practice talking across difference. And so that's hugely important to us um, as we work through all of our classes, uh, K through 12. All right, um, Beth is gonna take it away now with a couple of examples. All right, well, um, thanks, Raina. I, uh, at or originally, um, we had sort of hoped that, you know, Raina, or maybe thought Raina would need to sort of run off to class because we actually both have um, classes that we're still engaged in, and this is the last day of, of Zoom classes for um, upper school and middle school as well. Um, and so there's, you know, there's there was that, but I feel like, Raina, you said you were gonna stay on for a while now so yeah we'll, I think I can I can hang um, and the reason I just wanted to highlight that is that um, goodness flexibility has been the name of the game right and actually having some vulnerability to also be sort of um, you know I, I think a, a third grade teacher texted me early on in this and said we are building the plane in flight and I was like yep absolutely that's what we're doing in RTLP um, and so I just and remote teaching and learning plan. So if I say that, I want to make sure that that's what, um, that's what we engaged in as a, as a whole institution this spring as we transition to remote teaching and learning. Um, and so I will just say that I, 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 I thank you, Raina. Um, when I asked her to do this a couple of weeks ago, um, I'm sure she thought I was crazy. Um, but you can see how masterfully she has um, engaged the technology and really seamlessly transitioned her class um, and, and actually created something new and authentic for the moment um, as well. So um, masterful social studies teaching um, and the way that that lives out with our eighth graders. Um, but I also want to sort of think about um, the larger scope of all faculty and the things that we were grappling with um, when we made this pivot. Um, so many of us were true beginners. I mean, true beginners, never even heard of these things before, like Zoom. Um, like Loom, um, unfortunately, it's very similar to Zoom, but Loom is a screencasting app that um, many of you with lower school uh, students might might um, be familiar with. It's the one with the little bubble in the bottom and screenshot. It's, it's very easy, but boy, it took a little bit of learning as well. Pear Deck, um, you saw Raina um, talk about that and use that, as well as just new functionalities for our existing technology platforms around Seesaw and Canvas. So those first couple of weeks were really deep dives in the mechanics. Um, and then all, all faculty, like all of us, are really struggling sort of with that transition of balancing what this new way of working looks like, particularly if we have aging um, parents that we're worried about and caring for and friends, um, and then managing the task of, of our own students if we have children of school age. Um, being, being parents of all, of all of this in this really unique time period. Um, and then dishes have to get done and laundry has to get done and so forth. So a lot of blurring of lines and it's been, it's been quite hard um, to be perfectly honest. And I think Raina and I as, um, as mothers of young children will, will attest to that as well. So things that um, RTLP faculty have been, uh, well, the Blake faculty have been thinking about an RTLP. Um, when we first were given this charge, um, once we got over our initial shock, I think that there was really great leadership um, in this phrase, and I heard it in my department over and over, people coming back to this mantra of how do we now plan for um, finishing the year with integrity and not fidelity, right? So knowing right off the bat that we weren't gonna be able to replicate everything that was happening in our brick and mortar classrooms into this new space. So we weren't just transferring, we were creating in some ways. And in creating, we also really had to like pare down. So there was this real sense first off of just, what are the curricular choices that I'm gonna make knowing that less is more? less is more, less is more. What are the essentials? Um, in Raina's case, she just sort of abandoned, I mean, 
they were they they were going to go to DC. They were going to spend a little bit more time on the influential. They had to pivot, and she created something new in that space. Many other teachers kept on with the same units, but really had to reimagine a different methodology for um, delivering that content, but also asking kids to to engage in more meaningful ways. Testing, you can imagine quizzes, you can imagine can still happen in some ways, but in other ways they have to be very different. Um, so the second thing that that teachers really grappled with with the, was, was this sort of sense of um, what is the developmental appropriateness of, of the technology and the students? And, you know, that we, we go right to lower school when we think about, you know, how often are my kids Zooming? How often are they on the screen with their iPads managing Seesaw? Um, but we also think about it with the upper school, too, because we know that, that that kind of screen time over long periods of time is not good. And hopefully you've also, well, hopefully, not hopefully, but you probably also had that empathy um, in your own work and personal lives in the ways that we've had to engage the screen much more. Um, so there's a fatigue factor and we had to really be developmentally um, thoughtful about that. And the third and really the biggest and most overriding question that came from our early survey results um, and that we really engaged in, in department meetings, in faculty meetings, in one-on-one -on -one faculty lounges that we have on a regular basis where we just drop in and sort of say, ah, like how, help me with this. And, it, and that's the question of connection. Um, how do we stay connected, not just with our students, but with each other as a community, parents, um, that we would normally see in the lower school at pick up and drop off. We're not seen in that same way anymore. In the upper school, um, how are we continuing with advisory programs in middle school as well to stay connected to kids, be goofy with kids, um, and also kind of teach them how to do this space on the fly as well. So not only are the teachers learning these skills, but the students are as well with us. So um, the, the best thing that I wanted to show you, and, and Raina, you want to maybe click through a couple of these um, uh, screens, but I, someone asked a question um, in the, in the pre-registration around how we were actually engaging in social studies, a chance for kids to document their experience. Um, and it's interesting that actually a number of um, social studies students or teachers in a, in independently in a lot of different grades sort of decided in that creation moment to make this moment in time a great learning experience about primary sources and artifacts. And so there's a couple of, um, Rainy, you can go between 10th and, and 4th grade if you, if you will. You can see that it's basically the same activity that was, that was asked of 4th graders and 10th graders to really write about and reflect on um, what does this moment of time mean and what would a historian 50 years from now look back and want to know? Um, are we cobbling together and curating a set of artifacts in a museum, in a museum that, um, actually have like um you know some kind of some kind of multiple perspectives of the kinds of things that we're going for um so again integrity not necessarily fidelity to what we were planning to do for the rest of the year and again i think the best thing that we can do is to really reflect back to kids their own experience and find ways in our curricular decisions to document this moment in time um, and show them they're learning they might not be learning in exactly the same way that they would be if we were back at school um, but they are learning and we want to keep encouraging them and reflect that we are moving forward in your learning. You're not just stagnating. So a couple, and you can see this slide here. Um, I think a big, big component after our first survey in our, at least in the social studies department was almost constant daily ways that we are asking and surveying and checking in with kids and finding ways to really give get a sense of what is their experience we can't read their faces the same way that we would if we saw them their body language in class and that sort of thing and so it, it's um it was a challenge but i think we we kept asking kids to reflect 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 and that allowed us to reflect as well and pivot and change as necessary um so three quick takeaways and then um, mara i think will jump in with some of your questions and then rain and i can bounce back and forth but for me, I think as a, as a curricular leader at Blake, um, I, one of the ways I think that as we are, as we are thinking about the summer and um, the, 
the, the possibility of having to do moments and pockets of this again next year, um, we are thinking about a couple of things. And one is flexibility and pacing. Um, I know that uh, one of the questions was really about homework time, classwork time. How are you seeing that? How much is too much? And those are great questions. Um, and certainly ones we want to engage in, but I would also pull us back and make us think a little bit more about even that homework classwork divide and the best sort of practices of online thinking. We're trying to break that down a little bit more. We're trying to get kids to think about work. It's their schoolwork. It's their inquiry work, right? And sometimes in that process of the work, we'll engage synchronously. And sometimes you'll do it on your own in an asynchronous way. Um, but flexibility and pacing matters so that it's not just I assign it one day, it's due at the end of the day, but we give sort of a week or two chunks so that kids with lots of different needs in their households um, can still feel successful. Two is choice matters, right? We, um, we know that lots of kids want to express themselves in lots of different ways. You saw that with Raina's final project. Um, and so this is even more important in the RTLP space, um, we believe. And third is, again, getting at that connection. Um, I, had, I teach ninth grade at the, uh, at the moment, and um, my ninth graders were engaged in a research project. And those, I had almost weekly one-on-one -on -one conversations with all of my students who were working on that project. And sometimes a couple times a week, um, they would sign up for appointment slots. If I they didn't send out, I would, I would sort of stalk them and get them to sign up and get their parents and their deans involved. And so I had those one-on-one -on -one conversations with kids about work that they were doing. And what was interesting is that when I asked them just like, how are you doing? They're like, fine, whatever. But when we're actually engaging in work, that kind of authentic sense of how they really are doing um, was way more obvious. And so sometimes it's kind of like an indirect way to get in at students and their social emotional um, sort of temperature checks by engaging in the work. So we didn't pull back. We still um, tried to keep to the integrity of our, of our courses, um, but, we, but we did it differently. And I think that um, we were pretty successful given the time constraints and all of the, the work that we had to do this spring. So Mara, that's the end of my little prepared session. Um, if we, uh, if you want to jump in and sort of. Yes, I wanted really to share, we had some really fantastic questions and I know there were some people who are very eager to, to get some feedback from both of you. Um, one was, do you, how do you debate or do you debate um, security versus economic liberty? Um, another is, do you teach to disagree and be civil with one another? Or how do we do this? Um, given that tone and pejorative uh, vocabulary make a real difference. And how do you um, keep the debate civil when people are going back and forth? Those were some common themes and threads. Raina, go ahead. Um, yeah, I'll just start. Um, I think it would be so helpful for everybody uh, in our community, adult community, to watch our kids participate in a Socratic seminar with one another. Um, they are well trained from pretty young, actually, and especially starting intensively in seventh and eighth. But even back in the in the lower school, with identifying, you know, sort of their own unique identity and how that is different than someone else's but everybody's identity is valuable and everybody's identity is essential to making our community what it is um, in particular in seventh and eighth we really drill down into what a discussion needs to have and so we have a pretty robust discussion rubric that we we grade and assess the students on and so we're constantly talking with them and modeling for them what constitutes a healthy discussion across difference and of course, kids are um, using these multiple perspectives to read text too. And so they're bringing to the fore these sources that they've been grappling with. Um, and so when a kid just wants to say something that they feel deeply and have an opinion about, if they don't have any evidence to back it up, our kids are pretty well trained to say, well, it's fine that you think that, but what's the, where's the proof? Where's the evidence? Because they're so used to creating assertion, evidence, and justification paragraphs. Um, 
So we really hold them to a high standard of discourse. And in my class, I also, I just want to say, I think it's really valuable as an exercise that my students work together at the start of the year to create our own classroom constitution. And a component of that constitution is, what do we do if things get tricky in conversation? How do we support one another? How do we make everybody feel included? Because that can be a, a, a real danger um, and sort of the idea of moving away from the single story and moving away from one person and one voice and one perspective dominating any discussion. It's a challenge, um, but we work at it all the time. And then as to the economic security versus liberty discussion, absolutely that's part of um, what we do with our modern U.S. course in the eighth grade. And, and obviously we talk about that a lot at multiple levels of social studies at Blake. Um, and it is an important conversation that has been going on for a really long time. <laughs> if you think about um, what it means to have a capitalist free market system versus a, a socialist or even communist system. So. And I think from a department level perspective, that's, that's something that I, I feel very strongly about that we, that we think in terms of essential questions. And so that is, that's one of those classic es essential questions that we, we want kids to ask that question in fourth grade. We want to, we want kids to ask that question again in sixth grade and eighth grade. We want them constantly asking those kinds of deep um, moral and, and humanities like questions um, from you know from the get-go and so that is an area of growth I think for us as a as, as a um, as a faculty is designing curriculum around those essential questions um, but it's it's something that I think is embedded even if it's not totally explicit all the time for the kids some other additional questions one just came up and you addressed a little bit there is are the students being engaged in discussions of ethics and morality and you did just share that and the conclusions would be it's an ongoing conversation I would think at all levels mm -hmm. um, another one that came in um, is about um, journaling and time capsuling and family interviews this is such a pivotal and historical time in our lives that many family members or neighbors or friends may have experienced and so are there any assignments that are documenting these important times and how that's been addressed at different levels. Yeah, so um, I, I showed you those artifacts from fourth grade and, and 10th grade um, as a way of, of sort of highlighting that that happened pretty organically and spontaneously. We didn't do anything this spring in a, in a really organized or, or institutional way around a time capsule, if you will. Um, I could imagine, though, that that is something that as the summer, we, as, as, as the spring turns into summer and we have maybe a, a tiny bit more time um, to sort of plan for next year, regardless of um, where we are and where we're delivering our instruction and, and engaging with kids, mm -hmm. um, we, I, I could imagine that being something that is a little bit more organized and institutional um, mm -hmm. to try and figure out a way that we can pull these community stories together, um, create those kinds of um, artifacts because this is, this is an unprecedented historic moment and we would be remiss, I think, if as a department we didn't tap into that. Absolutely. Yeah, I can see us tinkering with a lot of different units throughout the course of the year and asking. Uh, in eighth grade in particular, we often partner with elder care facilities um, for our service learning. And so I'm imagining some kind of setup of remote conversation with elders and remote conversation with the support staff that work at those types of um, facilities and sort of documenting that experience would be really pivotal and important. Mm -hmm. um, another I just, this, uh, sorry I just I'm thinking out loud right now so my apologies back to the ethics and morality question a lot of that work at the middle school also happens in our advisory program which is actually where I'm headed right after this meeting um, our advisory groups are smaller size so 10 to 11 students partnered with a teacher throughout the year um, and so we often will have structured lessons and activities where we grapple with ethical issues or moral issues um, and talk about what it means relative to Blake's mission uh, and relative to our cultural competency 
uh, intentions um, to be a fully inclusive community. We have a lot of critical conversations taking place, not just in social studies, but also in advisory. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, another question came in. Um, who do you feel has been most impacted by this pivot with remote learning, a parent, a teacher, or a student? If you could speak to that a little bit more. Um, well, Raina and I are, um, well, so first of all, I will say that we are, um, we're all three, right? And all the time, and there's blurred lines like crazy right now. Um, I had to be a student first and foremost to, to learn and think about how I would best be a parent and a teacher during this time. And mm -hmm. so um, I, it, it's been a challenge. I've been doing a lot of existential reading, um, not necessarily reading on the how to's, but really the reading that fills my soul that needs to constant have that, constantly have that um, re refueling on a day-to-day -day basis. I put on the resources, those were my two suggestions about what to read in a pandemic. Um, I'm a, I go a little bit black sometimes. And so, um, you know, if, if you're aware of Station Eleven, you'll know it's a sort of dy dystopia novel that came out a couple years ago um, about a virus that, or pandemic that, um, sort of wiped out the majority of the world's population. So, um, and yet it's a really hopeful book. And so, you know, I, I turn to those kinds of things. Um, but I also am really, I'm really tapped into like, what are the larger experiences of parents and teachers around the globe? And um, it's pretty similar across the board. And we hear lots of themes of just sustainability and feeling really tapped out. And um, it's been hard from an adult perspective, but I think the hardest thing, and Raina, I know that you um, have another book recommendation as well, but um, I, you know, I, I think it's made me a better parent because I am really way more in touch with the emotional roller coaster of being a kid during this time. And maybe that's really normal and I don't see it all the time because I don't see them during the day when they're normally at school and I put them in the good caring hands of like faculty and, and TAs and staff. But I think it's also really unique to this moment. So Raina, what do you, I know that you yeah, I, I think my main lens as it, my main lens that I looked through this as it, uh, it all started was as a parent because I could see my five-year-old, six-year-old now, excuse me, kindergartner really mourning the loss of his classroom community and the magic that was his kindergarten classroom at Blake um, and just trying to be there for him and help him to learn uh, how to express himself in ways that would help us to move forward. So for me, the hardest has been to be a parent to my youngster because he is in such a hard place. So I think it is really incumbent upon all of us who have children, whatever age they are, but especially school age children, to help them through this difficult emotional time. So I read uh, Permission to Feel by Dr. Mark Brackett, who's out of Yale's emotion and, um, intel Emotional Intelligence Department. Um, and it was on recommendation of a Brene Brown podcast I'd listened to. So that's another great resource just to think about social emotional well-being. Um, as a teacher, I love the work of designing curriculum. I love the work of trying to imagine lessons that'll engage my students differently and get parts of their brain, you know, humming. Um, so that, that wasn't hard for me. What was hard was losing the connection with my students um, face to face. Um, and then having to toggle between Asher, my three-year-old climbing on me during a zoom meeting and yet I'm trying to teach kids. And I actually think those moments made every, every um, one of us feel a little more connected actually, because my students at, on their side of the screen could see what was happening in our house. Um, so the, the core of the question, who is it hardest on? It's hard to say. I would say it's been really hard for all parents to try to figure out how to work from home. Um, but it's also really hard on our kids who don't understand what's really going on. Um, so that's, that's, that's my two cents. Okay. And I think at this time, um, this will be the final question, but the one just came in about information platforms. And if you could just bring us up to speed as far as what um, the students um, are utilizing and sharing out with some of our participants, like what, what currently like for fun. I, I, I sort of took that question to be like how they, how they're interacting, but I don't know if that was the spirit of it, but I mean, our kids are in TikTok land right now yeah, for sure. Right. That's and a big Raina, one. Are you, are you in TikTok land at all? Cause no, I, I haven't. So not. 
I really um, have. I try so. and keep up with the kids to some extent, but I, yeah, I'm, I, I think I'm, I'm leaning into my Facebookness big time this spring that I'm just old and that's fine. But <laughs> I, the TikTok and the Snapchat is, is obviously really, the Snapchat is really Yeah, important. they, they think Facebook's for old people and it kind of right. is. And Twitter, actually, a number of my students are more and more um, just looking at Twitter and like, especially because our president uses it so readily. Um, they kind of see it as, oh, that's an interesting and novel way to communicate. And they, they themselves aren't necessarily on Twitter and tweeting regularly, but they follow people. Um, oh, Instagram for sure, too, is another one that, that's really big for them. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know, though. I don't know about the TikTok other than it's short videos and funny yep, ones, party? usually. I don't know. Yeah. Memes. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is learning that we'll have to do over the summer. That's right. Curriculum, yeah. curriculum delivered via TikTok, Reina. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yes. So thank you, Beth and Reina, for your eagerness to share how you both have grown and learned alongside your colleagues and students. And I hope you all agree this has been a fascinating class, understanding how Blake students have been learning the second half of the spring semester. It's been a rich conversation and provided firsthand insights of the nimbleness of Blake teachers and students during this unprecedented time. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this session is being videotaped and you will all receive a copy along with a brief survey as we plan to offer future remote programs for the greater Blake community. And also please be sure to save the date and mark your calendars for our next Breakfast at Blake scheduled for Thursday, September 10th with the head of a school, with the head of school edition featuring our very own Dr. Ann Stabney. For me, this is a strange way to sign off and conclude this morning's Breakfast at Blake program as we are all usually gathered on campus and have had a chance for a quick hello, um, a few moments to visit over a cup of coffee and the opportunity to potentially meet someone new. So I encourage you to reach out and connect with a Blake classmate, a friend or a fellow community member just to check in that bond of connection is so important and Blake is such a special community. So on behalf of the Blake Alumni Association, thank you for participating in Breakfast at Blake today and have a safe and healthy summer and be well.